Is that better? Ooh, yeah. Okay, try again. Hello, welcome. Um, so yes, as Florian said, I am representing Friend Water here, the Friend Water Network. So I'll tell you a little bit about that and about some of the things that we're interested in and why uh, we were so keen to co-sponsor this particular workshop because it has aspects that Friend Water is very interested in, in particular in the flood steam. So I'm Director of Hydrology at the University of Reading and I work in the Geography and Environmental Science Department and the Meteorology Department and spend my time talking between hydrologists and meteorologists all the time. So um, I'm quite well placed to try and um, bring these people together in lots of different contexts. Uh, I find most of my life um, doing these kinds of things. So in the Friend Network, this also happens. We're interested in bringing hydrologists and meteorologists closer together. We've heard from the WMO earlier. They're also very keen to, to keep this going. So um, hopefully we can all work together to, to um, bring some great outcomes from this workshop. So a little bit about Friend Water, in case you don't know what it is. Friend stands for Flow Regimes from International Experimental Network Data. It's a global hydrological research network program and it's aimed at improving all aspects of water science and sustainable use of current and future water resources. It's been running for over 25 years. It's part of the UNESCO IHP um, program, and it's, but it's a network, so it's, it's a very important part of that program. And it's about collecting and exchanging information and data, especially in an international context, so that we can learn from each other. Looking at the basic science questions, so enhancing scientific understanding of hydrological processes across scales from the local up to the global, very relevant for the satellite applications. Looking at different analytical tools, uh, hydrohazards such as floods and droughts, and very importantly looking at educating and developing capacity building pathways, looking at PhD sponsorship and MSc courses and other technical training courses. And disseminating knowledge is also an important goal, uh, cooperating with other international networks. So again, it would be great if we could um, foster more collaboration between the HSAF and the HEPEX and the Friend Water um, Network. We have a mostly global geographical coverage. You might see some uh, white areas standing out there that I won't mention anymore. Um, but we have a mostly global coverage. Lots of people are uh, in different kind of regional um, friend networks, but we do come together in international meetings. And there was a global meeting last month in Montpellier where we sat among the sharks and the piranhas in an aquarium to discuss some water themes. So I coordinate the Techniques for Extreme Rainfall and Flood Runoff Estimation Group. Um, two of the things that we are particularly interested in are using satellite data and assimilating that for hydrological applications and also representing uncertainty in hydrological modelling for flood runoff estimation and a lot of that includes ensembles. And we also coordinate across the International Hydrological Programme so with the Water Related Disasters and Hydrological Change Units um, and that's probably plenty about Friend Water, but just to say that if you would like to know more, please contact me and I can tell you more. If you would like to join our, um, our, our network, particularly the Flood Runoff Network, then do contact me and I'll put you on the mailing list. So I just wanted to introduce some of the things that I've been doing at the University of Reading, collaborating with ECMWS, the Met Office and many other partners, uh, trying to look at these two themes. So, um, what can we learn about using satellites for hydrological applications and what can we learn from trying to represent the uncertainty uh, in our hydrological modelling? What, why did it matter? Now, we've heard from um, Maria Elena about how in hydropower um, ensembles can be particularly useful knowing when to turn the turbines on and off. So I'm going to flick us back to being prepared for floods, so flood preparedness. Uh, some of you might recognize this diagram. It's reasonably old um, now from 2009, but it gives you a good indication of what an ensemble forecast is. And its key points are that it really shows you the extreme possibilities. Okay? And if you didn't have this ensemble forecast, you would not have any information about those extreme possibilities. And you'd just be on one of the other blue tracks, one of the other ensemble members. So 
we heard from the um, BFG about some of the floods in Central Europe. Um, EFAS uh, was uh, working quite hard during this time in June 2013. EFAS was one of the really, well, they really pioneered the ensemble flood forecasts, uh, really trying to push that forward. And in June 2013, EFAS warnings and alerts were issued for all the major rivers in Central Europe. And the key thing is they had a, an advanced lead time with that, so up to eight days in advance. Um, before these floods. And that's a real improvement from, say, 10 years ago, where we really didn't have that capacity for early warning. We didn't have that capacity for an extreme event coming eight days ahead. So we've got operational systems that are using ensembles. People are paying attention to them. We've got warnings out based on future possibilities the long way ahead. Here we're looking at the hydrograph, and it shows the EFAS multi-model hydrograph for Passau. Um, we've got the different colours indicating the different alert levels, so very similar to the spaghetti hydrograph I showed you before, different alert levels. The box plots are the ECMWS EPS running through the hydrological model. The red line is the high resolution and the black line is the DVD Cosmo. And the forecasts really give a very clear indication of budding uh, in three to four days ahead. And you've got quite a lot of certainty this event is going to happen and you can do something with that information and cascade it through uh, the warning chain. So I would say that this, this is evidence of success in ensemble forecasting. In 10 years we've come from having nothing to moving to a state where we're using these in operational forecasting successfully. So another indication, and we might hear some more about this later uh, from the Flood Forecasting Centre, but in, here in the UK, we also had rather a wet winter this winter. There were some significant storms that came through um, and uh, a few people got wet in Somerset and rather, rather a few more people in the Thames Valley got wet. Now, some of the ensemble systems were running this winter in the UK at the Flood Forecasting Centre and in the Environment Agency. In particular, the surge forecast was running in ensemble mode. And here we've got another type of spaghetti plot for an ensemble forecast. And we could see much, much earlier, so seven to eight days before the event, it was possible to see there was a reasonable worst case of a significant surge coming. And that those discussions were cascaded uh, through teleconferences. And then some action could be taken much, much earlier than we would have been able to had we not had the ensemble forecast. And this was the reality on the 6th of December, it, this winter, 71 severe flood warnings out. I don't think they got a wink of sleep in the Flood Forecasting Centre or the other regional flood agencies. Uh, um, but I think it was a, a really good indication that we're doing something right and this is the right thing to be putting into our operational system. However, we really do need to consider that the warnings only reach their full potential if they're really understood and acted upon by the person receiving. Although we've got some indication that the forecast warning went out and there was some activity, we're still missing that ability to track it all the way through the warning chain and all the way down to public action. And I think we need to do more in that field, particularly in the HEPEX field, that would be one of our focuses for the future. When we're considering rep representing the uncertainty in the ensembles, we also need to balance how much we're going towards higher resolution. Because there's always this trade-off before running more ensembles and going higher resolution. Now with rainfall, we really do want to get that convective rainfall right. Um, the same goes in hydrological modelling. Higher resolution does bring us some benefits. But also, if we also consider the uncertainty better, we can get more skill out too. Um, sometimes there's a push for higher resolution without taking into account the fact that we also need to bring that uncertainty analysis up as well. But if we're going to forecast operationally, we also need to have more information about the current state. We need to do data assimilation. We've heard some excellent talks on data assimilation and use of satellites for hydrological applications here. I learned a lot about HSAF. I didn't know very much before, so thank you to all those speakers. 
One of the things which is very important in hydrological modelling is getting that information and that data at the right scale. So if we're going to higher resolution modelling, then we need to be able to assimilate the right type of data at the scale. We don't want the broad brush kind of um, landscape scale soil moisture anomalies into our models. We need to have the details, the topographic features of the landscape are really important in generating the hydrological response. So we need to be assimilating our soil moisture fields so they take that into account. Um, and so we have a team of people at the university trying to, trying to look at that aspect um, of assimilating soil moisture. And we've heard a little bit about discharge assimilation, but another thing you might want to do is water levels and uh, inundation extent. And in that way, you can, you can look at the flood wave as it moves through a larger river. You can see which properties are flooded, perhaps. And that's one useful aspect, but actually another useful aspect uh, that we've found um, when we tried this flood forecasting project was you can actually use the forecasts themselves to try and task the satellites to start with. So if you look at the flood forecast and you think a forecast is coming up, you can say, well, we want some more information about the rising limb of this hydrograph. Let's see if we can get some information from the satellites. And this is becoming more and more easy as, as um, information becomes available. And so this kind of freedom of information of retrieving um, or tasking satellites during a flood event for research as well as operational purposes could be really important in the future. So how else can we improve our evidence base? Well, people are really into social media. We've seen the HEPEX, uh, H, HSAP and HEPEX hashtags flying around the room in the last couple of days. Social media is a really good source of lots of information on uh, flood levels and extents. People love to tell you when their basement has been flooded. They love to tell you how, how high the water is on their cars. So if we can mine this, we can use this to uh, calibrate and validate our model. And we have a team of people at Newcastle University uh, assisting this in the UK. I know there's other pockets around Europe trying to link together social media and modeling studies. Other things that we can do are go back and mine the data archives for newspapers. We can try and improve our understanding of flood return periods by going back to the 1800s and looking at relative comparisons of floods information that just isn't in the records. And sometimes you can find that it really dramatically changes the flood risk in some areas. So in Friendwater, we're also interested in looking at um, climate impact. We haven't heard a lot about climate impact in this forum, but many of the things that we've learned from flood forecasting also apply in climate impact modelling. We need to be able to represent our uncertainty. We need to consider our, our resolution. Are we doing things with the right resolution? Do we understand the hydrological processes acting in the landscape? Can we use um, data from satellites to help set up those initial conditions better? One of the biggest problems we have, of course, though, in, in climate impact studies is we don't have any validation data because we don't have the ability to travel in time. Uh, and of course, we don't have stationarity so looking back at the past is not always the key to answering that climate impact question. There are an awful lot of uncertainties related to the climate. And just to illustrate that, I put up these massive squiggles that um, come from looking at the annual mean precipitation over the River Seven catchment in the UK uh, for the Ensembles project and uh, the uh, UK SIP09, the Metrofish Ensemble climate. And you can see the spread is enormous, the annual mean precipitation. And if you try and bias correct that, you try and apply model output statistics to those, uh, and you try to feed them through a model such as HPV, because HPV is a very good model, um, you, can, you can get a range of different answers for what your future flood risk might be like for this catchment. And how do you know which is right? Uh, you don't, so you have to use your judgment. And this took an awful lot of computer power to come to this conclusion, and it might be that we might want to run scenarios of flood risk instead, rather than cascading uh, all of our models uh, through a giant multi-model ensemble experiment. 
So considering the uncertainty is really important, we need to know about those hydrological processes at high resolution, even when we're modeling at the large scale. Um, and what will happen in the future to things like HSAF and HEPEX? I've left this slide on because I've accidentally deleted my summary slide, so I'll try and remember what I was going to say. <laughs> I think if we're looking forward, then we really do need to see more collaboration in these areas. Both of these um, focuses, so looking at uncertainty representation in hydrological operational forecasting and satellite applications for hydrology, they're coming together, and they're coming together at the local and regional scales, and they're also coming together at the global scales. So if we can share our knowledge in these forums, then, then I think we'll come a long way in the next few years. Thank you. Thank you.